The Japanese government has released transcripts that help paint a picture of the frantic hours after the Fukushima Daiichi accident. The former head of the plant spent 28 hours talking to a government panel. Masao Yoshida died of illness last year. The 19 interviewees include the prime minister at the time, Naoto Kan. On day two, Kan flew to the plant and demanded that Yoshida explain the situation directly. Yoshida was busy trying to stabilize the reactors. In his testimony, Yoshida said there wasn't a free and open atmosphere. Yoshida said it was difficult to convey an accurate picture to the prime minister who was talking in a threatening way. Khan testified that he majored in science at university. He thought he was better equipped than other politicians to understand what was going on at the plant. Goshi Hosono was Khan's advisor. He said Khan should not have left Tokyo. Hosono added that the prime minister is a fiery person, so it would be difficult to change his mind. Kunio Yanagida was a member of the Japanese government panel that investigated the nuclear accident. He says the transcripts provide important insights. This information is significant for evaluating why there was not a proper crisis response system in place and the pros and cons of Khan's actions. The Japanese government finally declassified the records exactly three and a half years after the accident occurred. The government decided to make the testimony public after consulting Yoshida's bereaved family members. Some media reported on extracts of Yoshida's testimony before the official release. Some workers at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant are taking legal action. They are suing the Tokyo Electric Power Company and 16 other businesses. They say they were promised about $600,000 in overtime and hazard pay, but they say they've never seen it on their paychecks. NHK World's Yoshihito Kanetani reports on this edition of Nuclear Watch. The four plaintiffs were hired to remove debris from the site and check tanks containing contaminated water. Two of them are still working there. According to the lawsuit, the men were employed by typical subcontractors. They allege their employers failed to pay a special allowance for hazardous work. We are not being fairly rewarded for our efforts. This 55-year-old plaintiff still works at Fukushima Daiichi. He normally logs in 22 days a month there. Tepco pays an extra $200 per day as a special allowance for hazardous work. This should amount to about $4,400 for 22 days, on top of the normal wage. But he takes home only about $2,200 a month. The plaintiff blames this gap on multiple layers of subcontractors. Here's what the system looks like in his case. The company he works for is a first-tier subcontractor. The compensation originally paid by TEPCO is gradually reduced as each company takes its cut along the way. The plaintiff argues that the worker's fair share of regular and hazard pay disappears in the process. He is demanding unpaid hazard pay and overtime for a period of two years and eight months. All the subcontractors do is take a cut of my pay on a daily basis. There's no way I can accept that. Tsugo Hirota is a plaintiff's lawyer. He warns that the current system could endanger the entire decommissioning process. Having many layers of subcontractors means more people are taking a cut. The workers at the bottom don't get their fair share. TEPCO should be held accountable for turning a blind eye. It needs to improve labor conditions, otherwise the situation will make it impossible to secure enough workers to deal with the nuclear accident. TEPCO officials say they will examine the crimes and respond accordingly. But they say they are not thinking about hiring workers directly at this point. The amount of work required to decommission Fukushima Daiichi continues to grow. And so, 
there's a demand for workers. The number of people working at the facility has nearly doubled in one year, reaching almost 6,000 per day in July. The government and TEPCO say decommissioning Fukushima Daiichi may take as long as four decades. This lawsuit may force them to reconsider the way workers there are paid to ensure the supply of qualified laborers doesn't evaporate. Yoshihito Kamitani, NHK World, Fukushima. Officials with, Japan's, uh, with uh, Japan Atomic Energy Agency say they'll scrap the Tokai nuclear fuel reprocessing plant. They say the facility north of Tokyo will be dismantled as early as April 2017. And they say rising costs are behind the closure. Their decision follows strict regulatory standards put in place after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. They would have needed to spend more than $900 million to revamp the plant to meet new safety rules. The facility extracts uranium and plutonium from spent nuclear fuel. Workers have processed about 1,140 tons of the fuel since the site began operating in 1977. Company officials say they're almost done transferring the functions of the plant to another one in northern Japan. The Tokai facility was expected to treat spent fuel from a reactor in another part of the country. And experts say the closure may have a negative impact on the government's policy to reuse that type of fuel. Rescuers are struggling to reach climbers still trapped on Mount Ontake in central Japan three days after the volcano erupted. Their search operations have been slowed amid fears the volcano could become more active. Police say 12 people are confirmed dead and 24 others were found without vital signs. The volcano straddles Nagano and Gifu prefectures. As of Tuesday morning, it was still spewing smoke as high as 400 meters from the craters. 800 firefighters, police and ground self-defense force personnel are taking part in the rescue. They're trying to reach the people found near the summit, not breathing, and whose hearts had stopped. A hiker on the mountain posted this video on the internet. It shows rocks and ash raining down. The hiker hid behind some boulders when the eruption began and then took shelter in a nearby hut. One of the victims, a 23-year-old Yusuke Asai, took this picture two hours before the eruption. He was severely injured by flying rocks and later died from his injuries. Asai's friend, Yoshio Kawai, is still missing. Yoshio's father has been calling his mobile phone. He still has hope his son will be found alive. I don't mind even if he's seriously injured. I just hope. He survived. Rescuers believe some people are still unaccounted for on the mountain.
Gandhi said, He who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetrate it. We've been striking at evil's branches. If money is at the root of all evil, perhaps it is time to strike the root. How? Unplug. Our money is power. Stop buying what they are selling. Instead, give our money to local farms instead of the subsidized, monopolized agricultural conglomerate. Give our money to small business, not big international chains siphoning community funds for the excessive elite. Give our money to our children for education, not for weapons that kill other people's children. Give our money to enrich our health, instead of pharmaceutical companies that manufacture addiction. Give our money to restore the environment around us, upon which all life depends, instead of mountain topping and offshore drilling. Give our money to innovation, not industries bound for certain obsolescence. Give our money to creators, not looters. Turn off the television. Grow a garden. Ride a bicycle. Write. Read. Dance. Sing. Feed our souls. Follow our dreams. Strike this root chord of a new scale. Together. Sing a new song of awareness, kindness, and harmony. Resonate at the root. With love. European colonists landed at Plymouth Rock nearly four centuries ago. The evolution of America as we know it began. That moment was also the beginning of centuries of environmental degradation and genocide for the people native to the land. Now, in the year 2014, Native American reservations are some of the most oppressed and poverty-stricken regions in the country. And this week, the U.S. reached what's been called a historic settlement with one of those indigenous nations, the Navajo, which encompasses a 27,000 square mile reserve stretching across New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. The agreement requires that the government pay the nation $554 million. In return, the Navajo will dismiss a lawsuit filed against the government for alleged abuses on the land. Sounds fair, right? Well, despite the fact that the Navajo Nation President Ben Shelley has called the settlement a victory, it turns out the deal is far from just. First, consider the fact that while $554 million sounds like plenty of cash, with 300,000 members, the Navajos make up the largest indigenous nation in the country. A quick calculation will show you that each member will only receive a little more than $1,800 each. And that's if the money is distributed equally, which is highly unlikely. But the reality is that this money will do little to erase the scars the U.S. government and corporations have left on the community. See, in the early 40s, when the race for nuclear weapons had just begun, mining companies moved to Navajo land to extract uranium from the earth. Prospectors employed the Navajo as miners, selling the opportunity to work in the mines as a way for the indigenous peoples to save their land. But as journalist Brandon Loomis found while doing an extensive report on the lasting effects of uranium mining, the safety of the miners was a very low priority. In fact, as one former Navajo miner told Loomis, he never understood, quote, why the mine's white managers wore protective suits and masks while he and his Navajo comrades walked away nightly, powdered with yellow grains of uranium. But the answer is sadly simple. Their lives weren't worth as much to developers. And the Navajo were only made aware of the fact that uranium is deadly decades later. The result? Lung cancer, nearly 30 times more common in Navajo miners than the rest of the community. Other ailments include organ failure, liver disease, and cancer. But it's not just the former miners that are suffering. See, the very point of harvesting uranium was to create the atomic bomb. And when companies claim
closed their minds in the 70s, the 521 sites, which combined cover more land than West Virginia, were left unsealed. Unsealed. According to Loomis's report, gamma rays or radiation similar to that released by the atomic bomb is, quote, well above recommended doses at some of these sites. The poison is inescapable for the Navajo community. It's in the air, it's in the soil, and lingering in the water. Playgrounds sit near unsealed mines, and livestock feeds on, unpo on poisoned grass. And while in the last few years the government's made some small efforts to clean up the abandoned sites and deliver clean water to the nation, the extent of the damage has already been done. The Navajo community has been and will be affected by toxic radiation for generations to come. Studies in humans and animals have concluded that parents exposed to radiation can pass it on to their children in the form of birth defects, which range from chromosomal disorders to gene mutations. Women exposed are also more likely to miscarry than those who are not. Journalist Chris Hedges has called the exploitation of Native American communities capitalism's sacrifice zones, where the drive for profit has historically outweighed corporate and government will to protect the lives of human beings. Indeed, it seems that one of the most culturally rich and historically vital peoples were simply sacrificed by America's nuclear obsession. And despite the multi-million dollar settlement, there's no price that can be put on lives and land forever destroyed.